will not see a single feature of the tidal grade because my talk today won't be about tidal grade. That would be about single gene traits. Well, I'll start with a simple question. Why won't we make a flying car? Yeah? Well, not that we really need one like, at the moment, but like imagine, why not? It would be funny, yes, a cow flying somewhere in the sky. And, uh, well, we do have genetic engineering. Yeah, we can transfer genes from one organism to the other. We can uh, make a mouse which, which glows because it has a gene from the jellyfish. We can make a bacteria which produces some uh, medicine, uh, some hormone, for example, for humans because it has a gene from humans, uh, and so on. So why won't we just take some like, gene from a bat, transfer it into a cow, and then we'll be a cow with giant bat wings? Yeah, amazing. However, the problem is that currently we are not able to do that, yeah? And that's not the problem of the tools, yeah? We have quite efficient tools, we mentioned CRISPR and other tools, they, they are wonderful, they help to do amazing things. But the problem is that we do not understand many traits so well as for now. Well, genetics uh, as a science of heredity and variation started uh, not so far away, by, by the way. So we are now here, like somewhere in Krakow, whereas that is the place in the city of Brno uh, where uh, Gregor Mendel made his discoveries. Well, Gregor Mendel was a monk. He lived in the monastery, so that's what monks usually do, and uh, uh, he made experiments. At first he did experiments with mice. He tried to breed uh, mice, but then the head of the monastery banned it. Yeah? And then Mandel switched to pea plants, and he crossed pea plants of different varieties, which were different in some particular trait, like uh, purple flowers versus white flowers, yellow seeds versus green seeds, and so on. And by doing uh, quite a lot of work, quite a lot of field work, he discovered the principles of genetics, which we now call Mandel's principles, or sometimes Mandel's laws. Uh, and one of those discoveries was basically that we really have some hereditary <coughs> units, yeah? And we inherit one such hereditary unit from our father, the other from our mother. And the combination of them may give us uh, this or that effect. Uh, Mendel didn't know what uh, these units were, but today we know that they are genes. Genes are pieces of DNA molecules, which are uh, found in our chromosomes inside of almost each of our cells in the body. Uh, and today we know how genes work, like, more or less. Yeah? We know that these pieces of DNA encode RNA molecules. <laughs> RNA molecules are necessary to create proteins, and proteins are everything in our body. Proteins contribute to all of our traits, like hair color, color of the eyes, color of the skin, blood group, and so on. There are many of them. And that's really great, it's all based on the discoveries of Gregor Mendel and on the central dogma of the molecular biology, which you see here, which was proposed by Francis Crick in the 1950s. But there is one very old idea of classical genetics, which is actually not so true, but many people still believe in that. Well, this idea is as follows. A gene corresponds to one particular protein, and that corresponds to some particular trait. So we can talk about genes for traits. Well, nobody recognizes that seriously in genetics and science, but many people still think of genetics something like that. Yeah, there are genes for traits. And you can read news. Scientists discovered a gene for obesity. Scientists discovered a gene for alcoholism. A gene for that gene for this. Well, uh, one of the reasons why many people still believe it is the way genetics is usually taught in schools, possibly. Uh, well, here is the typical like picture from the textbook for genetics. Yeah, here you see two parents, yeah, which have some particular trait, uh, the same trait, or different traits, and, uh, well, they cross, and among their offspring, we can see uh, well, offspring with different traits. For example, well, it's a funny moment from basic school genetics that if we cross two black cats, theoretically, in their offspring, might be a white cat. 
because each of these black cats might be a carrier of a variant of a gene, which is actually for like white fur, not for black fur. And that is very helpful in teaching basics of genetics, of course, and learning it. However, uh, it confirms that outdated idea that genes somehow correspond to traits. And if we try to apply this idea to people, well, we may try, and that's also an example from a textbook, yeah? You see? Uh, parent with brown eyes, another parent with brown eyes, and they might have some children with blue eyes, yeah? Well, very sim similar to the pea plant of Gregor Mendel. But the problem is that this funny table, these funny squares about human traits are actually wrong, because that doesn't work like that. Uh, if you think about the color of the eyes, the color of the iris, it's very diverse. People might have darker brown eyes, lighter brown eyes, green eyes, hazel eyes, light blue, dark blue, and many, many different variants. And so it's very hard to uh, have uh, two people with exactly the same uh, shade of color of, of eyes, in fact. Well, some textbooks deal with that a little bit better. They present pictures like that that the model with two genes, so they say, okay, yeah, there is not a single gene, we've got two genes which interact with each other, and of course this model is closer to truth, but even that model with two genes does not represent the reality like 100% correctly, because in fact, yeah, there are two genes which mainly influence color of eyes, but there are dozens of the others which can also influence that, so in fact, uh, a single gene and even two genes do not correspond to that simple trait, color of eyes. And uh, often uh, in the genetics classes, a teacher offers us to do some funny game. Well, we can play it like now, by, by the way. Yeah? Well, raise your hand. Well, who, who can roll the tongue? Yeah? We'll try to do that. And like, okay. And, and who can not? Well, I, I can know for sure. There are not so many people here. Yeah, well, I'll admit that, yeah? That's not too bad at all. Uh, but, as they say, well, okay, that would be like, well, a dominant trait, that would be a recessive trait, and that is somehow related to the pea plants of Gregor Mandel, yeah? Green seeds, yellow seeds, people who can roll the tongue, people who cannot roll the tongue, yeah? And then there are many more traits to follow. Well, people with dimples and people without dimples, People having widow's peak on the hairline, and people with straight hairline, people who, uh, when they cross their um, fingers like that, then the, the right is on the top, and or the left is on the top, and so on. There are many, many different characters like that. Uh, but the problem is that actually none of this is an Mendelian trait. Yeah? Because uh, for some of them, we have a strong doubt that they are Mendelian, that they inherited in the Mendelian way, or for some of them, we certainly know that they are not inherited in this way. So there are no good examples which can be demonstrated in the class for single gene traits. And my opinion is that single gene in, in traits in humans actually almost do not exist. Uh, the only thing which can be really called more or less like single genish uh, in people would be in the field of medical genetics. That would be the story of uh, single gene disorder, single gene conditions, yeah? So in the internet there is a nice database called OMIM, Online Mendelian Inheritance <laughs> in Men, and that is a database listing uh, hereditary, mostly hereditary conditions, many of which uh, really result from a mutation, from a change in a single gene. For instance, there is a disease called cystic fibrosis or mucoviscidosis. That's a rare disease, but it affects more than 1,000 people in Poland still, probably even more. Well, we know the reason of that disease. That is a mutation, that is a change in one particular gene, CFTR gene, which is situated at the chromosome number 7. So we know its genetic origin very well. And the main symptoms of the disease are problems in the respiratory system, mainly in the lungs and bron bronx, and also some problems with the pancreas. Well, why does it happen? When uh, the mutation affects that gene, uh, one of the proteins called CFTR stops working, but what kind of protein is that? 
That is the protein situated in the membrane of the cell. Well, basically there are a lot of uh, proteins in the membrane, and they fulfill different functions, but, one of the, but some of them uh, really transport substances into the cell, or from the cell, or both. So CFTR is of that kind. Well, if it works, it should transport chloride ions from the cells, and it is also associated with the transport of water molecules. What's important? That's important for the normal mucus production. If uh, a mutation affects the gene, and the protein would be abnormal, it won't be able to transport chloride ions and water, and, the result of, and the, as a result of that, the mucus will be very thick and viscous. It won't be removed from the respiratory tract, and that would result with frequent infections, and also with inability to breathe normally. And earlier, when the treatment was not available, people with cystic fibrosis experienced early deaths at the age of like 20 years, or even earlier. Uh, and yet, we have the mutation in a single gene, we have a single protein affected, but we have problems not only in the lungs, in fact. The whole list of symptoms of cystic fibrosis would be very long. You see, it affects so many things in the body at the same time. So even if uh, there is something like single gene, yeah, so to say, it may affect so many things in the body at the same time. Well, it's hard to think of it if you still imagine our genome as a blueprint of the body. Yeah? And as for example, here is the technical scheme of it, simplify, of course, of a car, yeah? And there are different parts of a car, and the doors, and the wheels, uh, and so on. And if you think, yeah, well, yeah, the genome, each gene corresponds to some body part, to some organ, uh, to some structure in the body, yeah? It's hard to imagine why one gene may cause problems all over the body. But in fact, our genome does not look like that. It, I would rather compare it to the recipe, yes? So how to cook something in the kitchen, yes? So we have some ingredients, some oil, sugar, yeah, yeast and so on, water. We mix them, we do some procedures, and we obtain the dish. And we cannot say, in many cases, well, which particular slice, which particular part of the dish corresponds to which ingredient. There is no such a correspondence. But what we can say sometimes is what happens if we change the recipe. Yeah, for example, for this recipe for homemade pita, I could never cook that on my own, but uh, if we take 10 spoons of salt instead of half, well, I can predict what happens. Yeah, it will be salty. And uh, uh, we can, well, do the same thing with the organisms. Yeah, so if some mutation happens, we can sometimes predict what would be the result? Uh, well, for instance, I will tell uh, a story about uh, hedgehogs. Yeah, you know, everybody likes hedgehogs. <laughs> uh, well, a hedgehog is the name of a gene in a fruit flower. And the reason why it is called so is that a mutation in the gene changes the body of the larva. Well, that's an adult fruit fly, and that's a larva, it's with worm like. Uh, but if it is a mutant larva, it becomes not only worm like but also like hedgehog like because these uh, identical bands all fused together, the body is shortened and the larva looks like a small uh, hedgehog. So you see, the gene is named not after what it normally should do, but the gene is named uh, on like what happens if it doesn't work properly. And by the way, in genetics, uh, especially in early times, that was the usual way to name the genes. For instance, well, there is a gene called Tin Man. Yeah? Well, no, the Tin Man did have the heart. Yeah? And uh, the gene Tin Man, basically, the mutation in it uh, affects the structure of the heart. There is a gene called Ken and Barbie. Well, you can guess what it does. But the, the, the mutation of it affects the structure of sexual organs. There is a gene called Swiss cheese, and the mutation in it uh, pr makes hollows in the brain. Well, not so funny, of course. And there is a gene called Van Gogh, yeah? Just imagine. 
and the fruit flies, which have mutation in that gene, have their wings curled like this, like famous painting uh, of Van Gogh. Uh, so, the genes are commonly named after the, their particular mutation. And that gene was named Hedgehog. But that was not the end of the story, by the way. Later, after the gene was discovered in fruit flies, similar genes were discovered in vertebrates. And there were three of them, not one. And so, each of them was named after some particular hedgehog. Yeah? Two of them were named after two species of hedgehogs which really exist somewhere on the planet, desert hedgehog and Indian hedgehog. And the third one, well, possibly the most famous one, was named after Sonic Hedgehog, after the hedgehog from the computer uh, game and later uh, the movie. Uh, and later, like, we start thinking, what, what does that hedgehog do, actually? And, in fact, it does so many things. It, it affects central neural system development, eye development, finger development, teeth development. That's one of the most important genes. Well, we still hope. call it hedgehog because of that mutation in the fruit fly, but in fact, it's one of the most important uh, genes in our own uh, uh, development. So you see that the same gene affects so many things in the body at the same time. And on the other hand, if we look at some particular function, like eye development, and we think how some hedgehog influences that, we'll see something like that. Well, here is it. Here is our Sony. SHH, yeah, that's our gene. But there are many other genes interacting with that. So, Sony Hedgehog alone is not enough to make an eye. Yeah, there are the, there's the interaction of many genes and environment for that. So, from one side, one gene may influence a lot of traits. On the other side, uh, the same trait is influenced by a lot of genes. So, there is no that straightforward correspondence. Well, and I will finish with one of my favorite cartoons, you know, that uh, Soviet cartoon, and I like it for two reasons. First of all, it's quite psychedelic, and certainly who created that, they used some substances, but uh, I like it not for that, mainly. Uh, I like it because it demonstrates how genetics works, yeah? Uh, on the first glance, well, you don't see why, what's the correspondence between this and genetics, but I'll tell you. That's a story of a boy who went into the music box. Yeah, so his music box was broken, so he became very small, and he got into the music box. And there, he found a single detail which was broken. He repaired that, and the music box started playing music again. So, why do you use that to tune? Well, I insist that, yeah, a single detail if it is broken, can stop the music. But this single detail is not creating the music. To create the music, we need a lot of details inside of the music box interacting with each other. The same is with our genome, yeah? So, a mutation in a single gene, uh, or a single gene mutation can really cause a disease and can cause some particular, like, abnormal traits, but there, are, there is a necessity to use a lot of genes in order to make uh, uh, a normal trait still. So, uh, when we are discussing genetic engineering, yeah, when we are like playing God, like creating and changing the organisms, yeah, it's uh, a good uh, thing to think uh, whether we are really playing our own music or we are just trying to break something in the music which is already played or we are trying to modify it to sound better. As for me, that's a very good question. Well, thank you for attention.